Woo! Are you excited that the Rams won the Super Bowl? Yeah, man. I I watch every game since it was a it was a Cub. Yeah. Since it was a little Ram Cub. <laughs> since it was a Ramlet. Yeah. Back when they were, <laughs> back when they're there, there were the Missouri Ramlets. That's you know, when my love started. A true fan, a true fan. No, they had a, they had Jack, Jack um, Terlonki. Yeah, he was a legend. Yeah, Italian Polish Terlonkis, man. Yeah, big guy, big burly guy. Reminds me of He's myself. the reason I played the game. Yeah. <laughs> what the fuck are we talking about? <laughs> it's, it's all true. <laughs> Trying to Google it. All okay. right. All right. Well, we're <laughs> back, baby. Tea time. The ThriftCon podcast. I'm your co-host, Mars. Back again with my uh, co-host, my lovely co-host to my left, Ken Mead, and my co-host to my right. I didn't give him lovely. You, you might have noticed that. <laughs> Brian Frederick. He got cleaned up a little bit. He had too much fur. Yeah, look at this guy. Started seeing himself had, on YouTube. I had a whole thing look at that this I was going to do, and it just didn't work. I was trying to go for a 70s Travolta fade. Like... Feather fade, God and it bless. just didn't work. God bless whoever didn't give you that haircut. <laughs> did, you, did you pay for it, or did you have the wife do it? No, no, it was just shave and start over. I'll have to figure something out. But, I mean, when you initially tried. Oh, no, it was the same. We just shave it, grow it out, get the base layer. Oh, and you just and it just didn't it just come didn't. in like you no. wanted it to? No. I don't think that's how it works. Well, I don't think it is either. <laughs> you got to, like, then? go get someone you to, like. Just, you can't just will a hairstyle. <laughs> oh, you can. That's what they did in the 70s. <laughs> yeah, uh, that confused no such me thing a little bit scissors there. back then. I don't it's a long know. time ago. I don't know. I, I feel like, yeah, everyone is doing the 70s cut. Can we talk about that real yeah, quick? How, Guys and girls in LA, true. they all have yeah. the same haircut right yeah. now. Good for them, man. Just like Fuck LA. a messy mullet. <laughs> it is a messy <laughs> mullet, yeah. <laughs> why? What's the deal? Why do they all want to look the same? And why do they all want to look bad? I don't get it. What yeah, are you guys know. doing? That's I'll all. never get anything that's going on in LA. <laughs> it's poop it's on the ground. There's dicks <laughs> flying around. <laughs> This there is are. these are all real experiences from a few months ago when we were there. Yeah, man. He's speaking from experience. I'm all good on LA for like once a year. Get um, your LA experience. I like it yeah, a couple times sure. a year. I'm good for a couple times a year. I don't know. Yeah. If, I mean, I I thought that I could live there. I do think I want to live there, but I don't know. Maybe I get there and there's too much poop. Welcome to Tea Time, a show that spotlights the growing and changing world of vintage, and not only the clothes themselves, but the stories and people behind them. Covering everything from reselling to sustainability, this is the ThriftCon Podcast. What are we talking about today? I think we're talking about these things, right? That's my guess. We have, we have some shoes in front of us. Today, we are covering the history of Vans and also, you know, a little bit of the life and uh, before life, the life before Vans of, uh, of um, Paul Van Doren. Per usual, the stuff you can't go on Vans' website and just read. Right, right. The late Mostly. Paul Van Doren. Our sources today, Brian. Um, Brian's one of our sources. Uh, but Brian, where'd you get your stuff from? Uh, funny you should ask. The Vans website. Oh, no shit. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, there was. I mean, they did an all right job of putting the timeline together, but it's very corporate based. They uh, they like to talk themselves up. They don't talk about the the downs. Right. So much. They as, don't as talk as the about it. Yeah, I noticed. Uh, I was noticing that. Um, but there are quite a few people out there that have dug in uh, to the history of Vans. I mean, they've got what now sixty years worth of American tradition. So, uh, so, so yeah, there's plenty of it, and it's just been part of these underground uh, cultural things for quite some time. Skateboarding, music, punk. Yeah. yeah. So this specifically, we pulled from uh, Harry Abrams' Vans Off the Walls. Off the wall stories of soul from Vans Originals, and then heavily, um, I relied on Paul Van Doren's memoir, which I'm pretty sure is just titled "Authentic." Um, big word in the Vans community. That's where you get the stories. It's from the person. Yeah, right? no, I yeah. mean, uh, I, I, I actually have like an hour or so left to go on it. Um, you liked you know, it though, right? It's, pretty it's good. really good. That's really yeah, good. Definitely. You know, if if you like if you like the the podcast at all, we're just giving you a little taste of that. Uh, so I would definitely, or, you know, if you don't even ever listen to this podcast, if you're interested in Vans at all, you should check it out because it's a good, it's a good memoir. It's recent too. He just passed away last year at the age of 90. So dude was around for a long time uh, and he lived a long 
and prosperous life, honestly. Very, very wealthy when he passed away. I mean, yes. He's yes, doing all yes. right. And, but, all right. but I mean, he is like the epitome of like of the American dream for sure of when the American dream was still alive. Um, and, and yeah, he is, and just like, he is like the all, all American good, good old boy. You didn't see 50 cent at the Super Bowl. You're telling me hanging the upside dream down isn't alive. <laughs> Come on now. I mean, just, uh, no, I would say there's a version of the American dream that's still alive, but it's not Paul Van Doren's version. No. Yeah. Eh, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Prolific. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's hop right into it. Okay. So think about your top five shoe brands ever. The brands that you, you, you like, that you've purchased, that you've owned the most of. If you're under the age of 50, even chances are that Vans is, that might be on that list. And Def, definitely the, on the list for me. For good reason. For sure. Definitely on the list for me. Um, I, Brian, you were telling us before we came in, you counted the amount of vans counted, that are in your household. Counted the amount of vans. We have twenty six pairs between four of us, and my kids grow out of them within months. So we're usually vans. just reselling those because they have great resale value too. If they're only wearing them, I mean, through the pandemic, they didn't wear shoes at all. No need, <laughs> no need for shoes at all when you're not going anywhere. Yeah. So a lot of the the ones that we expected them to grow into, they grew out of. So Valid you know, point. we threw them up on. Mercari. So yeah, I got a bet going. Yeah. I say twenty six months, and Brian packs up his kids and his wife's and moves to the woods. Says now you don't never need no shoes. <laughs> twenty six months. Twenty six months. I think is that the right timeline? Spring. Yeah. Like, <laughs> when I can get Word. the potatoes 20, in the ground and twenty six yeah. weeks, even <laughs> maybe sooner. Maybe sooner. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, I I have a ton. I mean, these are a few of our pair, my pairs here. You know, we have the Supreme collab, a Disney collab. This is an old pair. I can't even remember. This is Mita's. It's probably seventies, eighties. Um, I have a Mad Happy collab, a pair of Skate Highs, just some classics. It's a good shoe. They're everywhere. They've kept yeah. it simple for the past, you know, sixty years. It's iconic, and it's it's really become a part of American history. Yeah, I mean, and born right in the streets of Southern California too. Mm. Like it, it is, it is a, it's an American brand. It was made in America, and uh, it was really helped along the way by by athletes. And by athletes, I mean the the skateboarders, the surfers, kind of like these subculture athletes and the rebels that adopted it early on, who weren't even really considered athletes at the time, right? right they were just right. the, kind of the. They were hooligans. Yeah, hooligans no, the I mean, they were kind of like skateboarders in, in, in the early days were like the weirdos, right? It was like yeah. a very, like a punk movement, um, I guess you could say. Uh, the brand now, though, pulls in over $4 billion a year for VF Corp, which is its parent company. And it's consistently one of the best-selling shoe brands in the world year after year. But before it became a footwear juggernaut, uh, it saw its fair shares of ups and downs it really, you know, they started from the ground up as a family company. It is a, it was a family company from the start. Uh, and to go all the way back to its roots, uh, we kind of, I think we should start there with the family, with Paul Van Doren himself and kind of his whole story. Okay. So we got two founders, they're brothers, there's Paul and there's Jim Van Doren. Right. And Paul is really the founder. So Paul is the guy. Paul was the one who went out um, and initially started, as we'll see later on. He did it, and he actually asked Jim. So for the most part, right in this beginning part, we're really going to be talking about Paul. Yeah. Paul was born in May of 1930 in Boston. So he's a, uh, I mean, he died when he was 90. So he, you know, it's a whole different era that he's coming up in. A whole different era. I mean, the, this was Ted Williams and Babe Ruth, he was watching them play, going to watch them play and shit like that, like a whole different era. He was born probably the same year as Don Draper. <laughs> exactly right. Born, born before t-shirts, right? Didn't we like born, before t-shirts. <laughs> born before t-shirts. Born before t-shirts. Great callback, Ryan. Oh my God, what a pro. Uh, his mother was of Italian descent and his father was Dutch and they were both loud. Hey, Paul, get over here. Loud. He joked that if, uh, if they had a family crest, it would have just been a plate, a lasagna, and a bullhorn. Pretty, uh, a good pretty place. accurate, honestly. I can, like I can, I can relate. But that tough love, you know, growing up in that types of type of family, people yelling at you, you always got something to do. It, uh, it really built his work ethic and allowed him to, you know, eventually he didn't do it specifically, but eventually, you know, build a four million billion dollar dollar company. You know. Yeah, I mean, his whole family worked. <clears throat> his dad had a workshop at the house and 
that's what his dad did for a living. He would create uh, initially like their big business was sparklers. Actually, um, they would cr- they would make sparklers every year, sell them before Independence Day, <clears throat> and that's kind of how they paid the bills. That's sparkler money, uh, exactly. And so Paul was New making Year's sparklers. Like, Don't sleep all, on New Year's. That's man. a big sparkler. It's true. That's moment. true. That is true. But so yeah, Paul is you know. Even in the younger days, everyone's pulling their weight. Everyone's working in the family. And that's just how it was. He's like, he's like, I didn't think anything. I knew five-year-old kids who were working on their family's farm. It's just, it was the, you you know, it was the thirties. Yeah. Yeah. It was a super, super tight knit family. And that kind of led him to meld family and business. Like his family was, was in for pretty much the whole time of of his, his part of the man story. Yeah. And it was, uh, you know, it really instilled him in him from a young age that that people were the most important thing. You know, it wasn't about money or things. Um, it was for them. It was just always about like the family, the friends, the people that surrounded them. And that was whether you know that was in business, in your personal life, everything. It was it was people first. Um, and you know, he carried that in advance. He always called it a people company that sold shoes. Uh, but so at, around World War II time. They transitioned from sparklers because uh, Paul's dad actually just, you know, kind of being an innovator uh, and uh, a businessman himself. He recognizes a shortage in clothespins for whatever reason around World War II. There's a shortage in clothespins. I don't know if it's the little like (laughs) I'm saying, I don't know if it's the little metal part or whatever, but it's probably, you know, supplies. A lot of those factories got got changed over to make things for the war. Yeah, it was a shortage Mm -hmm. of everything. I mean, going back to like the Levi's podcast, those World War I and World War II Levi's are being made with like- No threads, screen printing. Parts of them weren't made with, uh, yeah, like the thread wasn't in there. Like all all the raw materials that were readily available were getting pushed to the war. But, you know, people still had to live their life. There was still a country going on. So, like, people needed clothespins. Yeah, so his dad is like, mm, I'm going to make a, I'm going to design. He invented a new clothespin, used less material. It was easier to make. And he enlisted his Paul and their brothers to make it. His dad kind of made uh, machines that would create these clothespins. And Paul made thousands of them. That was the new job. Thousands of clothespins before, after the war, going back to sparklers. Got to get back in the sparkler game. You can't, you can't drop the sparkler game. Well, sparklers, know? sparklers will always be there. That's you real know what I mean. They'll, every year, like you said, even in two times a year, kind of six six months out. So it's kind of nice. I might those start two buying, big paychecks. I might start buying sparklers for Valentine's. Hey man, yeah, how do you how do you make support? sparklers? Uh, ooh, the, he talks about it in the in the memoir. Actually, Stuff that it's like a wire. Fire. It's like this. Like he actually was doing some like chemistry stuff. He would like have to mix this mix this mixture together or whatever, and then the wire, and then it gets kind of like dipped in it, and like a, you know it dries on. Like it. a it dries fiery wire. candle. Yeah, that's yeah. Like, yeah. Sounds yeah. freight. So yeah. Paul yeah, started so like a, uh, ten well, years old doing that. Or <laughs> eight years old. Yeah, nuts. <laughs> Go ahead, Ken. Go ahead, Ken. I'm sorry. Yeah, I was, I was gonna. I was yeah, gonna. Yeah, go ahead. So, Paul, the first time he ventured out on his own, he was about 15 years old. Right. He somehow figured out that his dad was paying an Italian guy on the side to make some sparklers for him, but he was giving that Italian guy 30 cents a piece compared to 10 cents Fucked a piece. Fucked up, dude. He's like, where was the family? So he Paul, said he was hot. He Paul, was like, oh my God. God, I've never been so mad in my life. He's like the first time I felt like just shorted. Yeah, so some other guy's getting three times more. And it's per and that's your dad. And it's dude. not your fan. <laughs> oh man, oh man. So he was super hot and he kind of got it in himself that you know, like I can't I'm not just gonna work for my dad all the time because, you know, as a as a potential father with, you know, the father parts in me, I would probably cut my son short too. I would. I mean you give him well, a roof. Well, the thing is, it's yeah, like. Yeah, I'm feeding him. Yeah. He had been doing it for years, too. It just like at the start, he's like, oh, I'm paying him this. And then, you know. Yeah, I mean, you, he, well, you never asked for a raise. Yeah. <laughs> you never <laughs> asked for a exactly. raise. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, yeah. But so it's right around this time. So this is eighth grade. Okay. He's in eighth grade at this time. We realize he's not getting the money. Um, and, you know, he, he's realizing that that school's not for him. Uh, and he essentially is sending a, spending a bunch of his time at the racetrack. Okay, so he is 12, 13 years old, and he and his friend Murph are sneaking into the racetrack every day, hopping fences, um, and then their uncles, Murph's uncle who was there all the time, would uh, they'd place 50-cent uh, bets on the boy's behalf, but on this like 
kind of this crazy bet called the daily double. So like, I'm pretty sure they had to win. They had to hit on two races in a row. It was almost like a parlay thing. But if they hit, it would pay out 50 bucks, which like neither of them had ever had that much. Money. Okay. Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? And Murph is just a homie. He's not part of the family. Correct. Anything. Correct. Yes. Murph is just a, it's just a buddy that he would go. That was a good friend at the time that that's who that was his racetrack buddy. Murph's betting style was more just off of luck and which is kind of gamble, you know, what his heart felt. But Paul, our guy, our Vans guy, he, you know, liked the challenge of figuring out what horses horses were the ringers and trying to figure out the sure thing, kind of made like an algorithm to decide, you know, who what horse is gonna win this race. I feel like I relate yeah. to Murph. <laughs> I put money, but then I put money on Odell in the Super Bowl. Next play he gets hurt. Oh my god. So I think it's my fault. What I did apologize. you put on him? Because he already had bucks. he already had his anytime TV. For, for the MVP. Oh, okay. Was was mid game. Like, you know, been, several drinks later, I'm I'm thinking, all right, I can do it. <laughs> hey, he's looking he's looking pretty good right And then now. I jinx him. Right, wow, that's hilarious. He's still, no, he's still that's won. amazing. He's still one. I'm Murph too. I'm Murph. You gotta yeah. play the field. With your Murph heart. Murph would bet on who who which names he liked and shit yeah. like that. Yeah. yeah, Paul was like he was neurotic about it. He became obsessed. He he spent a he spent, I can't, I can't remember what he, months in a row, every day at track, sneaking in. And he, he was, uh, he really did. He came up with his own kind of, his system, his own algorithm. It was based on, uh, you know, he would give the, the horses and jockeys percentages based on when they ran their last times. And then he based it a lot off of the guy, the handicapper guy who would make the handicap because he was like he's just deciding like that's just a feel thing so if if you know that guy then you you can really call it um so, so he took yeah. this he yeah. took this strategy to his dad and said hey we can you know i can make the family 25 grand a year with eighth, grade. System. eighth grade eighth grade eighth grade 1941 1942 he's like and he tell not even just i can make the family 25 grand he's like dad you gotta quit your job guaranteed you gotta quit your job stop working in the workshop you got you need to be at the track every single day but if you do this and if you do my shit we're gonna make 25 grand this year um and his dad his dad laughed at him his dad said, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. he's like nah dog but paul even in the book he was like i swear it would have worked i just never got the chance to try it <laughs> i swear it would have worked i love that but I, yeah, I, the, one of the reasons i wanted to include that anecdote um i think i just to pause there is is He's like, again, 12, 13, and just the way that he approached being at the, the tracks is it's the way he approached working at Randy's. It's the way he approached Vans. Um, and, he's a and risk all the taker. He is, but, but he, he's methodical. Oh, my yeah. gosh. He, he is amazing. And, you know, time and again, they, they talk about it in the book, amazing at identifying problems mm -hmm. And being able to t take 10 steps back and see the entire operations, um, like the whole chain of command, like kind of identify where issues are, where problems are, and how he could streamline it in, in the best way possible. We'll see it time and again. But this is, I think that's one of the earliest instances. So we know the horses didn't work out for him. Um, eventually, he found himself getting into manufacturing. How'd that happen? His mom made him. He's fucking 12, 13 years old, hanging out at racetracks and pool halls every day. And that's Good how he was woman. making money. And his mom was like, this is ridiculous, you know. And then it's, it's the 40s. Everyone's all conservative. He's in like a real nice Italian family. And his mom's like, no, 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 no. Uh, yeah, so she pulls him to come work with her at uh, Randall, uh, Randolph Manufacturing, which they, they, the whole family calls it Randy's. So that's kind of what we've been referring to it as and will refer to it as. But so he goes to work with, uh, with his mom at Randy's, uh, and his first job is delivering thread and materials. All Randy's does, the whole purpose of the company is to sew uh, uppers of shoes onto Keds for the company Keds. So they would just sew, sew the top part of the shoe onto the bottom part of the shoe for Keds, and that was all Randy's did, the entire company. And so... Paul comes in and all he does is he is really, you know, first low level job. He's just delivering the materials to all the seamstress stations. Uh, but he comes in and on his first day, his supervisor calls in sick naturally. Uh, so he's kind of just thrown into the fire on his own. Someone kind of comes in and tells him, yeah, here's what you got to do. Here's all the stuff. Here's where it needs to go. Leaves him alone. 
So spends the day walking around delivering all the, the materials to the seamstresses and just kind of eyeing the place and, and how it's run. And by the end of the day, he's like, just, he's just frustrated. Cause he's like, wow. Like he just sees, sees so many problems. Um, kind of knows from the immediately identifies flaws in the assembly line. Um, and he just, he can't take it. It's like eating at him. And so he waits until everyone leaves. Uh, he stays after hours and they all leave. And it's a five story factory and he just starts resetting the floor. By himself. So he's still a teenager at this point. He is right? a teenager just, at this point. He's like 13 years old and he got his was first I day. At I wasn't I'm rearranging saying, corporations, that's I'm for sure. That's- 13 years old and he just starts <laughs> resetting the whole floor. Uh, and he, and he, he, around, he's doing this, you know, it's midnight now. And as he's doing it, um, Bob Cohen walks in and he, he, he recognizes him as Bob Cohen. And that is the founder's son, Randy's son. Uh, and so he is a little bit sauced. It's midnight. He's kind of like had some drinks. And Bob's pretty much like, what the fuck are you doing? Oh, let's do a little role play. <laughs> hey, son, what are you doing here? Why are you moving my factory around? You be, you be him. Oh, I think, I think that. <laughs> I, was, I was coming. Okay, okay. Hey, man, I came in here today and your shit's all fucked up. My, my, I, I'm Your not shit's fucked, fucked up. up, all right? I, I know what I'm doing, all right? I, I might be 13, Jack, but I can see something dumb when I see it. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, 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 hey, you just give me an hour or two, and then, you well, know, it'll you, be fine. Just show, show me, give me, show you what, how do we show do? me what are you doing. How, show me what's going on. Brian, how do we do? I feel like we can make this into like a TV show at some point. <laughs> oh, we didn't Black get to years. the end, but you know, Mars <laughs> cut me off. I was I was leading into. Oh, the, you were gonna? Yeah, I was you, going. Well, okay, going. so <laughs> they start fucking fixing it together. Yeah, no. So that is how that is what how it ended. So essentially, Bob, uh, he he's like, okay, kind of. He hears him out, and then um, Paul starts showing him around. I like you know giving him his ideas, showing him what he's doing, and then Bob instead of being uh the 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 bullshit like owner's son like oh you can't do that actually does the cool thing he helps him out that is pretty cool because i Rolls can imagine sleeves up i could imagine me like a little kid pulling me around he's like we're gonna play tag <laughs> and 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 if you're wearing a yellow t-shirt then you can't be tagged and i i'm just wearing a yellow t-shirt because because that's the one that i picked this morning and and just, just come yeah here, no i think it says a lot about bob yeah bob it does. does it says a lot about bob. bob to be able to like take a step back and be like well hey you know you're not wrong you're not wrong. And also, it's one in the morning and I'm drunk. Let's do this. Let's get in there. <laughs> he had to be really right, though. He had, he had one shot. <laughs> so to be true. Really right. So, so our true. boy Paul really kind of never left. I mean, he was there for 20 years and he got all the way up to vice presidency. So yeah. he's, he, was, he was doing it. He did. He did. I mean, he did. He was responsible for so much at Randy's. Paul was Randy's. Uh, you know, he, he, even before he was in the vice presidency, he was he was helping to shape that company. Uh, one day at lunch, he's at lunch with Bob because they had become friends, and he's uh he just kind of asks him like, "Hey, why is Randy why is Randy's only do the uppers? We have a whole factory. Why don't we just make our own shoes?" Uh, and that was he to, to, to Paul's knowledge. That was the the end of it. Um, a few weeks later, he, he hears the mumbling of it, and then a month later, Randy's completely stopped stitching uppers for kids, dropped their contract, and they started manufacturing their own shoes. They started, our guests started, they had, it was a six-month process. They had to shut the whole factory down to, to revamp it to manufacture shoes, which is even more so, like, shows you how much they merit. they like, oh, this took this kid's idea and then, then shut their business down for six months to, to, to change it, you know? I mean, he's not so much of a kid anymore. He's probably 35-ish. At not that at this point, no. You said in, oh, this okay. Is, this is before, this, so there. in his 20 years there, okay. he grew that. But this is this is pretty early on. This is probably, he's I, he, he might be late teens, early 20s, might be at this point. Teenager. Yeah. Maybe. Probably 20s. They have a lot of merit. They see a lot of merit in Paul. Paul's, Paul's Randy's boys. Paul's Randy's boy, all right? Mm-hmm. That Bob, Bob, that is like when they need something fixed, they go to Paul. And in 1963, Randy's had a big problem, needed something fixed. They uh, straight up lost a, over a million pairs of shoes. Now, they were found, so they weren't <laughs> lost, like gone forever. <laughs> but, you know, they, uh, Paul's sitting in a meeting 
uh, talking about warehouse and shipping in an era um, of the Randy's West division. And, and he kind of hears this and he overhears it and his heart drops and he's just like, Oh my God. And uh, you know, Bob comes to him afterwards. Like, can you help with this? Can you fix it? Um, Paul? Yes. Yes. You freaking idiots. I can fix it. I can fix anything. I'm Paul fucking Van Doren. So they send <laughs> Paul from Massachusetts uh, to California to, to go fix that shit. Uh, it was a big mess. So all they had to do was like, well, we got to solid the warehouse. Essentially, like they had to just redo the entire inventory. Bob didn't want to do that. He fought Paul in it. So he's like, I'll give you three months. You're not allowed to solid the warehouse, but I'll give you three months to fix this shit. And he left. The moment he left, Paul's like, all right, we're about to solid the warehouse. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so he did just that. And they were like, even the warehouse is like, I don't know. And he's like, no, nah, trust me, we're going to do this shit. He doesn't know what he's talking about. He's going to come back and just be happy about it. Uh, and he did this, did just that. Three months, Paul fixed the entire problem. He, found, he, he gets all the shoes back in the system. And it did a bunch because, so at that time, Randy's, all of their shipments, they were only getting about 60 to 65% of the, the shipments out. So like when they would get an order, they could only fulfill 60 to 65% of the shipments. Because they had so many shoes lost and they, they were just, yeah. like, the, the, the supply chain was so fucked up. Supply so they were chain. missing out on 35 to 40% of their profit every single time. So the moment Paul fixed that in the West, it, it automatically added like 30% sales to their books. That like, was just sitting it, there. That, that, that <laughs> was, was just, just sitting, sitting there. there. So it was nuts. So, I mean, yeah, three months, he completely, he, he just overhauled the whole Randy's West operation. Um, and then by 1964, with Paul's help in the West, uh, Randy's had grown to become the third largest shoe manufacturer in the U.S. So because of becoming the third largest shoe manufacturer, Randy is awarded full control of Paul's. the West Division. <laughs> Paul's award, not Randy. <laughs> Randy gives Paul full control over the West. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, and, and, you know, they gave him a pay raise. And this is when he earns that VP title. So this is in uh, 64. He gets that. Finally, works his way up, gets the vice president uh, president title, and they let him bring who he wanted. So this is when he brings his family out, but also, you know, he brings uh, his brother Jimmy, gives him a job. He brings Gordon, his friend, like a lot of the people that he had working with him in the East, he moves his team out to the West. Hell yeah. So we'll get there. So summer of 64, Paul gets this idea to put out his first specialized skate shoe. They call it the Randy 720. But it didn't sell very well because Randy's the brand, Paul, Randy, Randy, the brand, <laughs> Randy, the brandy, only put it in a couple specialty stores, which really isn't where the kids were going to find them to buy. Them. It's not where skaters are going. They're not going to like specialty sports stores like a, a freaking dicks or a, like the equivalent of back. Yeah, whatever it was. They were going. the anti that. Yeah, because yeah, exactly. they're probably right. not even like thinking of their shoe that they need as a sport. You yeah. know, it's just yeah. like a life that they're living. Yeah. Yeah. And, but also this summer, uh, Paul set up a booth for Randy's at the U.S. Open for surfing in Huntington Beach. And uh, Duke Kanahanamoku. God, I'm so happy I hit, I hit that. Wow. I'm yeah. California. First try. Oh, dude. So Duke comes by the booth. And if you guys don't know who he is, that is the godfather of surfing. Basically invented the sport. Uh, so he comes by the booth with all his boys. And they're wearing matching blue Hawaiian shirts. And Paul being the businessman that he is. He sees an opportunity and he's like, yo, yo, yo. He throws in one of his shoes and he's like, you need some matching shoes for those shirts. And he's like, mm. he's like I can make them for you right now. We've got a factory right down the road. You need some matching shoes? Let me, let me get one of those shirts. So one of his boys takes out the shirt. Paul jets over to the factory. Three hours later, comes back to the surfing open when it's about wrapping up and, uh, and gifts Duke this custom pair of of uh randy's shoes at the time because he's making randy's still so he makes give him this custom pair of randy's shoes that have the exact same uh pattern because he actually just cut the fabric from the shirt so it's not like he used like a screen printer or whatever he just took that dude's shirt cut it up um and then sewed it on as an upper and so, so my dude was shirtless yeah yeah okay, yeah. yeah but he was but like at the beach yeah he's at the beach and he said that um he was a good looking dude so he said the girls didn't mind yeah. yeah, if your name's Duke, you can be shirtless yeah. anywhere. Yeah, he I took mean, Duke's boy's shirt. Yeah, he did oh, take Duke's. Boy's Duke shirt. wasn't giving his shirt up. Come on, Duke's this is not, Duke Kanahanamoku, yeah. dog. Kanahana He's not Moku. giving his shirt yeah. up, dog. But so yeah, Paul, and this is a big deal. 
there, there's photos of Duke in it. It's in the paper, so it gets some ex, it gets some uh, you know exposure for Randy's. And also, this is now a big moment because Paul has now kind of tied himself to the skate world and the surf world. Well, surf world turned into skate world. If I'm wrong, maybe right. What do you mean? Like. Like probably at this point, skateboarding's a thing, but it's not a thing thing. Right, so but he had already made the this. World this get into. this is the same year he made and released the set Randy seven twenty. Yeah. So it was definitely he was doing stuff for skating but and I, surfing. I think all it's important to think the way they were thinking was that skateboarding was almost like just surfing on right. the ground. It was right. a lot it was of almost surfers, like they were the same. Yeah, sport. using yeah. surf moves yeah. on asphalt. Right. Yeah. 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 It was, uh, yeah, dude, street surfing. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> exactly. Street I'm surfing. a street surfer. <laughs> uh, God. Yeah. I, and the other thing, you know, that we'll come back to is Paul and this, this customization idea. This being able to like, oh, you know, we can take pretty much anything and turn it into an upper and put it on the bottom of these shoes, right? So that's another thing that became big for them later. Uh, but February 1965, Paul gets a, ball, a call from Bob, Bob Cohen, the, the son of the, you know, the founder of Randy's, who's now mm -hmm. in, he's head honcho now at Randy's, is Bob. And Bob's like, basically, tell, he's, you know, he's, we're, we're going to promote a couple of guys um, that were previously in California. They're going to be assistant vice presidents. And these are the same dudes that had created the whole fiasco that Paul was just sent out a, a, a two years earlier to fix. I'm guessing it's like Bobby's cousins or something. It's shit. Uh, it's it's got to be some shit, dude. And he's just like and Paul, you know, he pushed back. He he told him how dumb of an idea he thought it was. He's like, you know, we have a ton of guys here who have been putting work in, who are boots on the ground, who deserve that position way more. And Bob tells him to go fuck himself. He's like, you know, it's my company. I can do what I want. I, you know, you 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 can tell me to do whatever you want to do. You want to tell me, but I'm going to do what I want to do at the end of the day. And Paul's like, you know, after I heard that from someone who, who goes to work in the morning and he goes home before noon, I was done. Fuck you, Bob. <laughs> yeah, it's like, Bob, Bob's not the guy. You're not that guy, pal. I'm out of here. Uh, and there has been a few times that that had happened before. And Bob kind of, you know, tried to, oh, Chase. Oh, no, no, Paul, Paul, come back, come back, come back. And Bob didn't do that this time. He said, if that's what you got to do, that's what you got to do. Bob, you fucked up, man. So Paul's on his own now. He's doing all right financially, but pretty much all he knew was shoes. So, he's a you shoe know, guy. he's just, he's got to get in shoes. Shoe um, by fate, that very same night, Paul quit and he gets a call from Serge Dahlia. Say that right? Yeah, Serge Dahlia. A good friend, friend from Japan who Paul had struck a deal with at Randy's to craft some high quality shoe components at half the price. So, he was, he already had this deal going on with this guy in Japan, Serge, and he knew that he had the good stuff for the low. Yeah, Serge was another reason that Paul made moves at Randy's because he, he was instrumental in him being able to turn that whole ship around in the West because Serge came in giving him, him stuff for half the price. So Paul's going all like, fuck Bob, and Serge is like, yeah, fuck Bob. And then they're <laughs> yeah. like, nah, you know what? You're, you're good, bro. I'm about, to, I'm about to get you some money. Come to Japan. Let's get this shit popping. Yeah, Serge, is, he's all about it. He's like, you're, you're fine. I have money. I have factories. You don't need Bob. You don't need Randy's dog. He, fat so I bet they're fat. He he mails Paul an open ticket to Japan. Is you know he, it's a, it's a it, I I don't even know if this exists today, but it's for Japan Airlines. So Paul can just call any Japan Airlines um, travel agent in California, book his flight whenever he wants, flies through Hawaii. He's like I made it through Hawaii, so you could hang out on the way back. Serge is a freaking baller legend. Yeah, uh, and so and so Paul next week. Flies down to Japan to go meet with Serge. After a trip to Japan and some negotiations, obviously, because, you know, our guy Paul, he's going to get his. They had to get to know each other a little yeah, bit. Yes, Serge know. agrees to invest 250 Dowie into the money. Van Dorn Rubber Company. Yep. That's hella uh, bread, too. I would guess that that's about 2.5 mil. 1965. Not 3, 1964. Actually, sorry, yeah, it is 65. 65. I'm guessing 2.5 mil. If I purchased an item for 250,000, then in 2022, that's 2.2 .2 million. Wow. Yeah, that's a lot of that's a lot of bread. Yeah, and and sh and he was ready. I mean, he was ready to go with that. He's he flew him down there to give him that money. 
He was ready to go with that. Serge knew what was up. He could see it in Paul. Paul had a unique idea, though. He wanted to make the shoes at the factory. Yeah, so make and sell. That was the unique idea too. Make so, and sell, yeah. So he was going to make, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He wanted to make uh, them at the factory. Uh, yeah. No, he wanted to make them. Sorry, you know, I tried to save you. I should have just flamed you. I tried right. to save you. So what I'm saying is that's that's fucking kind of a crazy idea. So he makes them there and sells them there. It's like boom, boom, right there. Imagine nobody's doing that. No, like, no, where no. Where can you even possibly, that's like, that's like ordering a steak at a kitchen. You know, it's like buying. Shoes I think out a better of, analogy would have been: it's like ordering a steak at the farm, like sitting at the table at. The oh, farm. that's good. I like. Yeah, that. I yeah. mean, there's a reason why everybody looks the same in photos from this time period is because they didn't have any options. You yeah. went to J.C. Penney. You had two dresses <laughs> to yes, choose from. Yes, yes, yeah. Yeah. There was a couple brands. A couple you know? brands. Yeah. Speaking of J.C. Penney, I'm rocking yeah, a J.C. Penney sweater right here. Sick. Yes, sir. Um, courtesy of the arc thrift store maybe Car- cool. Car- super cool season. mars we were all wondering what that was yeah yeah you know hey it was relevant to what brian <laughs> said he creates a factory but designs it so there's an actual portion a whole retail store that is attached to the factory um it's all the the, the shoes are designed made sold all right there all on site um everyone's involved in every process pretty it's pretty amazing the building and it's all done in the too. u.s huh is it, it really? It's still there, but it's ugly as fuck. Oh, well. They covered up all the windows. Sure. That, yeah. So yeah. one crazy story I heard is when this store opened up, 12 people came in the first day. They ordered the shoes. This is correct. And then they they then realized that the shoes weren't there. Well, because. So they waited for the shoes. He didn't have change. Yeah, so they waited for the shoes, came back to get the shoes. We're trying to buy the shoes. He didn't have change. They had to come back the next day to get change to actually buy the shoes. Yeah. But he gave him the shoes. So. He, he gave him the shoes and he was like, well, shit. He's like, I never did, never even thought about retail. I was a shoe guy. It shows you how mad of like retail like mind I was, but he didn't have any change in the drawer. So he's like, you know, you guys can have these shoes. Just yet. you got to come back. Come back to pay. So they came back to came back to pay, but one of the people didn't come back. Not oh, really? not not with the shoes. Like he, she didn't take. She didn't even come back for the shoes or to come back to pay. And so he was he was a little bit scourged, but he's like you know eleven out of twelve. That's not bad. not bad. That's pretty good. He's like he was like I felt pretty optimistic. Two weeks later, she comes rolling in for the shoes and was like I don't live around here. Like I couldn't get back that day. And he was like twelve out of twelve, baby. This shit's gonna work. <laughs> That's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So think about this um, this manufacturing operation. Um, they were making each waffle mold by hand, right? Yeah, yeah. He and and Jimmy made each waffle mold. by Jimmy's hand. his brother. Jimmy is his brother. So he so he is the one who you know actually he created all the molds. Uh, Paul designed the molds. Jimmy Jimmy made them okay. then to be used. Yeah. And one of the reasons they did that is they tried to, you know, they tried to get some old molds. You know, at this time, you know, they were, uh, they, they had, there was another, they basically had bought these old molds that ended up being like all rusted and then that put them in a hole. There was all types of shit. So yeah, at this time, they are making their own and and rolling with it like that. Um, but so yeah, all these other, a lot, not all, but maybe most other shoe manufacturers at the time, they're using uh, fillers in their rubber and fillers weaken the structure. They make it less flexible uh, and they really just decrease the longevity of the sneaker. Um, the other, the cool thing about the, the, the un, you know, the basically the kind of the accidental feature of this, this full rubber sole too, is it made them more sticky, which Paul really hated at first. Uh, and he's kind of adverse to like, oh, they're they just really kind of like sticky when you walk and stick to things. But think about who that would be good for, fucking skateboarders. Well, the, his first niche that he thought he was going to hit was people on boats. Yeah. They were boating yeah. shoes. Yeah. Um, so the van, like the vans, these ones, probably not without, without the reinforced heel and all that. But this type of shoe right here or a Ked with um crazy sticky heels Mm -hmm. he thought oh you know i I could sell this as a boating shoe but the uh the boating market you know maybe not as big as the uh skateboarding market that was starting to open up and so yeah because of you know him seeing some value in it he he was okay he let it slide he kept it but he really didn't love the feel himself at first he was kind of adverse to the stickiness uh and you know the initial dream wasn't to market to uh, shoes for athletes or even boating really uh, it was really just about making a good casual shoe it was it was for the whole family 
it, that's why the, the first store was called House of Vans. Even in the first store, some of it, you know, in the first year, I think he had a group of customers that was like a family. And it was um, this mom and two sons. She came in to get one of the son's shoes. He had another, the other kid trying a pair of shoes and he loved them. But like that kid already had new shoes. So then the mom like looks at, at Paul, like, what the fuck are you doing? He's like, no, 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 that one's on the house. That one's on the house. Um, and then that's, that's cool. That's a cool. Story. Yeah. And then she, uh, ends up being like, oh, the uh, telling their husband because he did that. She's like, well, you should get some shoes too. And he's like, I don't really need new shoes. And she's like, yeah, all you got his dress shoes. Like, get some shoes. And he's basically like, oh, okay, I'll just get these ones. Points to the light blue. And she's like, that color sucks. And he's like, oh, I'll just I'll get these ones. She's like, that color sucks. You don't know what you're doing. Like, you get the. And he's like, I guess I like the green ones. And he's like, so he gets that. <laughs> and Paul, after that, he's like, the mom, the mom's who I need to sell to. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. He, Hell yeah. That's you know, he he was like, that is who I'm selling. That is my. He's like, you know, that's that's made me not who's wearing it, but that's who I'm selling. Yeah, to. that's who's deciding what the family's yeah. gonna look. Yeah. So that like. was like a big thing as well. You know, he was really just. It was really just a. It was a casual shoe. And when they launched in March of 1966, the men's models sold for 4.49. About 38 dollars by today's standards. About, <laughs> thank you, Brian. Uh, <laughs> and then about uh, 2.29 for the women's. Uh, which is how much in today's standards, Ken? That's about twenty dollars by today's standards. Okay, great, great, great. great. Uh, the first year they launched, they had a, a fl the flying V logo. Google it. Uh, the flying V logo was on the heel instead of the Van Doren name. Then when they did, and that was the only year they did the flying V, just that first year, nineteen sixty six. Then they switched to it. Just said Van on the back on the back heel. Then it said Van Doren. Then it said Vans. Then we started seeing iterations of the Off the Wall logo, so on and so forth. Might try to put a timeline of that together somewhere. Pretty cool to see all of them next to each other. And there's, if you Google it, it's very hard. There's a bunch of just grainy photos. No one's done it right. Yeah, so I feel might like try they, to do that. I feel like they kind of fell into the Vans thing too because the kids were just saying, hey, let's go down to Vans. Right. Yeah, let's grab yes, some yeah. exactly yeah, right. It's kind of, we, we, that, that we have that kind of in here later, but it really is just in the, uh, it's it's that part of that skate culture, right? Yeah, that's yeah, a, yeah. that's a word in the in the skate and surf, surf culture. People were, you know, slang in vans. Slang that's where they were. Yeah. I mean, it just it makes sense. It is like a another big word in that in that world. So let's think about how these these shoes are bought at the House of Vans or the Van Doren Rubber Company. Customers come into the store, they customize their order, which is unique. Then those shoes are then made and they can be picked up within the day. No other retailer in the world, nobody was doing this. He's making custom shoes for people to walk in and and choose from. And this and he does it like they're able to bring their own fabric in. That's how he's doing it. So the, it started because a girl came in with a dress. She uh she had this specific pink oh, dress. Hell yeah, that's she couldn't sick. find anyone that had she had made the dress and she could which a lot of women were at this time. She couldn't find anyone that had shoes, sneakers to match it. Uh, she wanted to wear sneakers with it, though, specifically. Vans has all these colors, so she came there. They had a pink, but they didn't have the right pink. So she's, she's upset. Um, she's about to leave, and Paul's like, whoa, 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 you got any more of that fabric? And he's like, yeah. And he's like, I can make you a pair of custom. I'll make you a pair with that. Smart. And, he, and she's like, well, how much is it going to cost? And he's like, it's not going to cost anything. It's like well, the way our shit's set up, it'll be really easy to do. Just pay me for the labor, 50 extra cents. Wow. And so she, he did it. She actually ends up, she's like, well, can you do this one too? She comes back with orange and pink. He makes her two pairs. And after that, the next, the, the next staff meeting, he was like, yeah, we need to do this. Like there's, there's no one doing this. And like it, it's, it opened up so much. Just a yeah, huge he could, possibility. He could start right? making shoes for, or he, and he did, he started making shoes for like, sports teams and clubs and every you know just getting everybody in these matching shoes which was impossible for a big company making shoes overseas yeah, exactly or even in in the u.s like it, that was impossible to do they went to every high school like oh you're white red and gold your basketball team needs, i got white red and gold shoes oh your your whole cheerleading squad needs some shoes to match your school like we'll just make you the and then sizing too even podiatrists started sending them to vans to make their shoes because people who had two different size feet and what he would just make them their own custom like two different size shoes that's fucking tight man. yeah he was killing it yeah. killing it that's so tight so tight um and another crazy thing about this first year 
Vans opened up 20 retail stores in their first nine months of operation. Seeing how the successful the first two stores were and then running the numbers, Paul and his accountant fought him on it first when Paul was like, I'm about to open 10 more stores in the next couple of months. His accountant's like, what are you fucking nuts? <laughs> and then he showed him the numbers and he's like, if they keep going like this, I'm not nuts. I'll be able to sell my entire production. Like, our, like we'll, we'll sell out, you know, without having to to get any other retailers, without having to ship to anybody else. We'll sell out ourselves. Yeah, which no one had done. Yeah, because when you sell to another retailer, you you obviously don't make as much money. You have to take, you have to sell to them so they can make money. Which so. he saw happening at Randy's. He saw Fuck that firsthand. It. Randy's Fuck man, yeah. Randy's whack. Yeah. So that this is that was you know part of the decision making here. Um, but opening that many retail stores that fast obviously had challenges. The main one being staffing, uh, and then around like the nineteenth or twentieth one, because he again this is Paul he, the way he grew up. Everyone in the family worked, so it was no different for him and his kids. Every time they opened a store, it was the same formula. He would go sign the lease on Monday. On Tuesday, he would get the whole the whole family in the car, and they would drive down. They would completely overhaul the store, build out their own custom shelves. They did everything themselves so they didn't have to pay for it. They built out every single retail store themselves, him and the kids and the wife. Wow. Um, shelves, all that, displays, would build it out through the week, open on Saturday or Sunday. I love this. I'm liking this more than <laughs> than the Nike story, bro. I feel that. I, I am. I feel like that. He's making the shoes. He's making the stores. He's yeah. not over there in Japan. Like Obviously, Nike scaled crazier, but like, Man, I like this. Yeah, so uh, like uh, around 19, 20, 20th store, um, they're just they're out of people to staff it. He's pulling everyone. He's pulling his manager's family, their family's family, like just figuring out people to work these and can't find anyone to manage the uh, this this new store. So ends up having to leave his eleven year old son Stevie to manage the store by himself. A ways away from the house in California <laughs> for like half a week. I, I can't even get my fourteen year old to take out the recycling. <laughs> oh my gosh, Stevie! <laughs> Let alone and but Stevie was very store. Stevie was super. You know the way they talk about him too. He's a super charismatic. Always was into the the stuff. Always down to help. Like Stevie was pretty much. He was jumping at the the, the idea. Like let me do it. Uh, one of his first customers was this lady who came in. You know, can I help you? All this shit, and she was just pretty much pissed that like that he was the only one there working. that there's a yeah, child like, <laughs> is this fucking <laughs> real life and but stevie ended up doing such a good job sold her two pairs and she sent a, a letter yeah. to the to the corporate like is if this is like what your younger generation looks like your company's going to be just fine stevie stevie and, sets it off well steve he ends up he, he ended up running the, i'm pretty sure he's like he's ended still up running the company yeah, yeah. yeah he and he's ended up being big uh for bands um yeah, wow. They're, He's doing good. I agree. This is a great story. You, gotta, you guys got to listen to Authentic, man. So the hub of the whole operation is in Anaheim, and um, it's safe to say that they were definitely in the, in the right place at the right time. I mean, absolutely. You have to be, yeah, for a lot of the, a lot of the successful businesses were just there. Yeah, yeah, we find that a lot in all our stories that we dive into. It's, it's a matter of timing. There's that whole book on it, Outliers, Malcolm Gladwell. His whole, his whole thesis is that it's just like, being there at the right time which you know there is some critique to that but um when it works it works and it's a yeah. symbiotic relationship too right uh, sk uh i don't want to that's a big that's a pretty big blanket statement but i was going to say skateboarding needed vans just like vans needed skateboarding like they were vans became this integral part of the culture was you know uh kind of filled a gap for them and like utility as far as footwear goes and shit mm -hmm. like that and and vans obviously needed skateboarding and surfing um very much like you know realized that too lucky for them recognized that and then they ran with it i mean yeah. they were wearing like converse and things too but that was more of an east coast thing this was like a homegrown oh yeah oh this yeah. didn't even yeah. dawn on me the um the importance of the grip on the shoe was because there wasn't grip tape. Grip tape. Grip tape. Absolutely. Yeah. I didn't even, that, that was I big at that first. That didn't even dawn on there me. There was like, not grip know. tape. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, that's One of those most right. fascinating skateboarders from the time. I, I can't even remember his name, but he, he pioneered the gorilla grip with his toes. He would just take and grip the board in order to jump. Oh my like, God. Can you imagine just no, no. falling on concrete and hitting <laughs> a nail and just <laughs> some, yeah, just, uh, yeah. 
Sketch. Wild. Sketch. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So he needed vans. He yeah. needed a pair of oh vans. Oh my God. He did. He did. He, pro- he probably got some eventually. He eventually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, so because of their reliability, the gum like bottoms, the, the grippy bottoms, uh, these these Van Doren boat shoes, uh, which was really what they were. They were, you know, like we said, they were designed kind of in the the vein of boat shoes. Uh, they were referred to, or preferred. They were the preferred kicks of a lot of kids, like a bunch of kids, a bunch of kids trying to be the cool kids or follow the cool kids. Uh, and they were known to the Vans company as style number forty four. So that was their their big ticket. It was style number forty four. Uh, we know them now as the Authentics. That's that's the Authentics right there. I think that's really cool. Like if you think about the the driving force of the company, their ethos is that they didn't want to make a like highly designed shoe. They weren't worried about being fashionable. Down to the names, bro. Like in the office, yeah. they were just calling these joints fucking. That's the that's the forty four. How many yeah, forty fours do we style have? Style number forty four. Yeah. Yeah, it's like they they're so simple. Forty four. The arrow was like ninety five. Um. Yeah. No, it's true. It's true. And uh, you know, it just. This timeless too. It's crazy, so so nuts. This, this this design, how how long it's held up, and how how little it's changed. I think a good thing too is is there's a unisex appeal to it too, and they haven't had to change hardly at all when they go into women's where you know it's the same shoe. It's just the colors. Well, right? in fact, they he in the in the first one or two years of retail, they had women's shoes and men's shoes, like we saw. Women's were two twenty nine, men's were four forty nine. Um, but he noticed about, cause he's big on, I, I listen to my customer. I pay attention yep. to my customer. You know, when they launched, they only had four colors, but every time the buzz would happen, people would be clamoring for another color. He'd make another color. Um, and then there, he, he basically just noticed like women are just coming in and buying smaller sizes of the men's shoe. Like there was, you know, a lot of the, there was a, a ton of, um, uh, the, the you know the women's rights movement was big right at this time a lot, a lot of like you know empowerment yeah, you're talking you know. 1960s california exactly I mean, that's right. free love central down there and so right? you know there yeah. was a lot of people women were trying to to get away from the dresses and like the just like the typical what was seen as what women should wear right, yeah um so they were wearing men's stuff and he kind of was like man he was he was very early in the our stuff's unisex he stopped yeah. making women's he stopped making women's shoes and he just made shoes and he's like these are for men and these are for women both of them um you know colors might have been catered to one or the other but um he really did he, he stopped that early on in their business and just started doing the unisex thing which was ahead of his time so let's talk about are they on here yeah yes, this yes, yes right yes. here what's going on here well, uh, we can, yeah, we'll zoom in on this after. But so essentially, when they first started, um, the first year or so, they were creating just this diamond pattern, you know, that you can see kind of in the bottom, the diamond pattern in the waffle sole. Uh, and it started, uh, it started cracking. It was, it, it, this diamond pattern wasn't, um, wasn't strong enough around this part of the shoe. So what did they do? He figured it out. He's a smart guy. He added nine vertical lines through the diamond pattern, which really create that more the waffle pattern that we see. Um, and that is what fixed it. That became the new patented Vans waffle sole. This is their sole. Um, and that it essentially made it, you know, a legendary shoe. It, it's, this is held up and, and stood the test of time with this design right here. So... We'll take a little pause here, a pause, and then we'll uh, we'll jump into really where it gets into skateboarding. That's what we really want to know about. That is, uh, that's where it starts to get big. So around this time, uh, legendary skaters Tony Alva, Stacy Peralta, they are blazing through the scene in California. They're, they're taking that whole state by storm yeah these uh, are these are like the original z boys z town dog town yeah. but you know what th- th- these are the people that really made skateboarding a thing if you're a period. skateboarder you definitely know the names yeah. even if you're not skateboarder you probably have heard the name peralta there's For like sure. an entire yeah. skateboard company now you probably watched lords of Dogtown because that was a fire ass fire ass movie. film what was that 2001 yeah. i don't know brian i was 10 or something yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
already <laughs> drinking. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, yeah. So Tony Alva, he was at Tony Alva is actually the inspiration for the off the wall, you know, phrase that Vans would end up coining. You know, th- that phrase was already it, it was around in, in pop culture. It wasn't they didn't invent it. But again, not who does it first, who does it best. Tony, he is he's he's known for wall rides. Um, and as the story goes, after the first time he did a wall ride, someone yells out, man, he just went off the wall. Yeah, we see these Olympians <laughs> going like 40 feet from the ground now. And that's just a just a feat of physics. We uh, see 11-year-olds on Instagram going like 40 right. feet off the ground. So when dude, they it were is doing, getting hectic they got out there. they four inches out of the top of the pool, that was the craziest yeah, thing yeah, yeah, up yeah. until like, that point. Dude, you just went off the wall. Yeah. So we watched, me and my <laughs> wife watched Thrashing the other night. It's on Amazon. And that was 84, 86. And it's about, you know, just skateboarding culture yeah. coming up. And that is an absolute iconic piece of film. Like, yeah. Yeah. Supersedes anything made ever, period. Done. Yeah. You know, and like just seeing the style, seeing the skateboarding tricks, quote unquote. I mean, my eight year old is better now <laughs> than, than all those guys. But that was the pinnacle. I mean, Christian Hasoy was in it, Tony Hawk, like just some of the youngest like pros, icons now, they were in their teens. Yeah. Just yeah, jumping off of walls and doing goofy stuff. But so that is that's where it came from. But that's that's yeah, off absolutely. the wall and you know, vans seen that and I'm like i mean look it's on the it's all over this that was that was vans is off the wall it's yeah. on the back of the shoes everything yeah. little skateboard on the box on the shoe one cool thing i saw when i was doing my little side research was um the barracks posted this video that was sponsored by vans and it was all about the history of vans and they were interviewing um tony alva and he was kind of talking about um, the ownership he felt and the and the connection he felt with the Van Doren brothers in the in the process of designing the shoes. And he basically was like, we need the heel reinforced. We need this and that and the other thing to make our tricks bigger, to make these work better. And um, it actually led them to introduce the model number 95, which is the era, which has the reinforced heel mm-hmm. and Yes, yeah, Tony Alva and Stacy Peralta feel some real co-ownership of that shoe because they were in the factory like this is what we want it to be. The other cool thing part of that story was when they were skating these shoes around, it just adds to the sense of flexibility that the whole company had. They would wear out a pair of shoes and come in and just be like, yeah, I need a new right shoe or a new left shoe, whichever was the back shoe. Because the, mostly what they were doing was just steering and stopping with the, they were stopping the board with the, with the back shoe. So they just come in and be like, yeah, let me get a new shoe. I don't really care what color. They'd be walking around with like one beat up red shoe in the front and then their brand new blue shoe in the back. And it didn't matter. They'd sell it to them for four bucks. They're like, it's just one shoe. And like, you know, it's either one or two, you know, it's half price if you need one. Again, adapting to your customer's needs. Being able to be flexible, like Nike was not selling one shoe. Yeah, I'm gonna pull up time. to the van store and ask for one shoe, see if they're still. Ooh, that would be funny. That would G-G. be funny. That'd be a good, uh, a good TikTok. <laughs> that'd be hilarious. That'd be such a funny TikTok. Can I get just get the left of this? <laughs> uh, yeah, no. But w- another cool thing about Tony Alva and um and Stacy being involved in those the Vans ninety fives the eras. They had kind of, this just shows too that Paul was really in the community trying to make things for skateboarders. When Paul made the Randy 720s, um, they actually, uh, he, he, they worked with Paul in that as well. They were involved in that process a little bit and he got um, input on them uh, from them for the 720s at Randy's. So they nice. had known him since then. Um, and I feel like that He's is another reason. Lad. Right. And that's another reason that, that, he, that they were like, this guy, he, he actually does this. Like he's been making shit for skaters. He's been trying to do this. He's been perfecting this for years now. So I feel like that just validated him in their minds as well. And then they all kind of had this pre-existing relationship to, to come together um, and really make something timeless. Yeah. I mean, for anybody listening to this who owns a company or is making a product or whatever, I mean, the biggest takeaway with Vans right now that I can see is you have to listen to your customer no matter what crazy bullshit they come up with like this dude was selling people one shoe that's not <laughs> right. normal like yeah do and Paul, stuff- paul's not a skateboarder either he's not like embedded in the culture he just 
saw it and decided to ha- help the culture along with what they needed. Right. And that's he, absolutely. he only had these face-to-face interactions. You can post up a Google form, get people to fill out what yeah. they think about your product, leave an open bubble for them to, you know, add something custom that, you know, you hadn't thought of. Get the internet to tell you what you should do with your product. We yeah. did it with Thriftcon. Like there's, you know, we put up a form of where do you want to see us go? We probably wouldn't like real shit. Atlanta was crazy on there. And we were like, okay, well, we should probably go to Atlanta, I guess. Like, <laughs> right. Yeah. Like use the technology yeah. that's there. You don't have to interface with people directly. But when people tell you something, you ought to listen to it and you ought to make good on whatever they wanted to see because those are your early adopters, the people who are actually going to define your company. You can't ignore the people who are your most vocal customers and most dedicated. Yeah. All of that. Because Paul started working with uh, Alva and Peralta, he, he gained newfound credibility with his core customer, with right. the skateboarders, um, the people that he was really selling shoes to. And after going to the Olympics, um, he went to the Munich Olympics with his brother, kind of just sits on the sidelines and sees Adidas and Puma and then playing all these big games with the, the sponsorships and all that shit. Uh, he kind of kind of to come back and do the exact same thing with the skateboarding world. So he starts to pay uh, some of the athletes, the skateboarders, three hundred bucks to wear the shoes at competitions. Um, you know, just just infiltrating the skateboarding community. And from what I understand, athletes. he was notoriously cheap about advertising too. So this was a big step up in his kind of just new ventures of getting someone to wear them. Uh, but they wouldn't get buses. He would drive them to these competitions himself because <laughs> yeah. he Get didn't want to pay car. for it. Right, exactly. That so, reminds you know, me of the um, the Venus and Serena movie. Have you watched that? I have not yet. Nope. God, it's so good. When when their dad is just like driving them around all these country clubs and all these sponsors are coming at them and all this stuff. And it's like he's right there because he wants, you know, he can write the story or tell the story a little bit more clearly if he's driving to the competition with them. He can give them, you know, tips on how to get the product out there the way that he wants it. You're not going to, you're not going to have that connection with your sponsored athlete if you're not there. Yeah. If you just send them on their way with 300 bucks. Yeah. Yeah. No, 300 bucks was probably about 2,500 bucks. I'd get I'm good at this. Just throwing numbers just throwing out. Numbers. No, bro, look it up right now. Look up what 300 bucks is. My God, dude. What year are we in? What year are we in? a nice 75. 75. Oh, 75. So, no, it's probably 1,800. 1,500? 1,500. We'll say 1,600. I'm close, dude. Close, man. <laughs> I'm close. Ryan, don't give him anything. <laughs> give him any freaking leeway. Shut the calculator off. It was 1,567. Um... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so you know he they start the Z Boys, the Zephyr competition team, uh, classic. We've mentioned mentioned it a couple times, but legendary skate team, uh, and it really made a mark on skateboarding history. Yeah, you can't talk about skating without talking about them. Just, but what was the one thing you talked about earlier today? There was a big. Oh man, it's it'll be in our timeline. I'll I'll get back to it. But you know, whatever. We're here in '87. Stacy Peralta drops, you know, this this crazy legendary um, yeah, the Bones skate Brigade. video with the with the Bones Brigade. It's called Search for Animal Chin. And Paul didn't get the shoes to the boys, and they were all rocking ones. Jordan was one. skating in one of the most legendary skate videos ever. And it's uh and I feel like that's like a big deal. That that did a lot for it. Jordan ones in that world too. Yeah. And now like, I don't know. That's a, that's a big moment. That's a big moment. Big, huge moment. Um, they were going through some shit right then though. So yeah, yeah that was right right thick. Right. Right. Let's, so now we've kind of covered, that's really, you know, for us, that's, that we wanted to, to, to cover those early years, how he, he formed it, how he kind of made it into what it was and, and found his niche in skateboarding and the surf culture. Uh, but, but I think let's just maybe a little timeline. Timelines um, are nice. I like Yeah, just, just a little timeline to, to kind of cap this off. We, we'll touch on some things through the 80s, 90s, 2000s, uh, and, and maybe some final words. Ken will get up and do a dance and we'll leave. Yeah. 
So we start in '66. That's when Vans is Vans. Yep. And they start, March 1966. They start with the style 44. That's a deck shoe. Um, it's got the rubber soles, and it's meant for boating. And that's kind of what we just talked about. That's mm-hmm. the. They're basically that's heads yeah. with different rubber on the bottom. Yeah, we got us there. We got us all the way to there. In the 70s, this is when the brand really starts building up. Uh, 1976, first time we see the Off the Wall logo. Uh, so they, they debate, the bands debuts their first shoe specifically designed for skating too. And this is that one we talked about earlier, the number 95, known to us as the Era. And it was, uh, you know, designed closely with Tony Alva and Stacey Peralta. Yeah, it's got basically like a chunkier heel. It yeah. just makes it a little bit easier to skate in. Uh, 1977, um, we actually see the introduction of the jazz stripe. This stripe right here. This jazz stripe, um, that is a... By uh, Paul Van Dorn. Yeah, it's a he's little doodle. Not, he's not Phil Nightweight. Phil Knight, right? Not Bobby. Yeah, yeah, yeah yes. Phil, it's not Phil Knight pl- paying some secretary intern to make a logo. No. My guy did it himself. Did it himself. The old school got the stripe, which is their number thirty six, um, and then uh, the the number ninety eight. Uh, in this same year, in seventy seven, uh, the number ninety eight is the the classic slip on the damn Daniels. Um, the damn Daniels are introduced in nineteen seventy seven. <laughs> And then uh, the by, old school, real <laughs> quick. The old school was the first proper marketed skate shoe that Vans made. Okay, yes, yes, yes. And um, it had reinforced leather, People jazz started, stripe. Yeah, it, it, that was like the one they had shoes that were being used for skating. But that old school is the one that was like, this is for skate. And that's the number thirty six. And then a year later, numbers uh, the number thirty eight, which is the skate high. The, the the high top version of the old school pretty much uh that one launches in 78 also featuring the jazz stripe and by the end of the 70s vans now has 70 stores in california um and they sell through dealers internationally nationally they're no longer only just selling in their own stores so they have grown brian take us into the 80s coming into the 80s we'll call this era a growing pains era because they're not doing so hot initially and we'll talk about that too but those uh uh, fuck growing pains oh (laughs) nice dude (laughs) that's what we need not gotta use not late at all (laughs) uh so we'll talk the the early part of the 80s uh in 1982 there's a Film called Fast Times at Ridgemont High. And Spicoli. Spicoli played by, did you see Sean Penn at the Super Bowl? No. The dude is ripped. Oh, He's got to really? be in his 60s. And it's, yeah, looked like 50 Cent. <laughs> Cut the Sean Penn hanging upside down in a suite. But, right. But in 1982, <laughs> he's playing a stone teenager. And uh, they actually send him a pair of the slip-ons. They hadn't done the checkerboard before, but again, going back to what they saw people doing, they were just drawing, these kids on the street were just drawing checkerboards on their vans. So that was was actually instigated by Sean Penn. Mm -hmm. He said, my character ought to wear vans. Ought to wear vans. And and then he was like, okay, well, we'll we'll send Universal. Sent them out a couple of pairs, didn't think anything of it. Uh, They liked them so much, they ended up putting it on the soundtrack cover and... There's a scene where he's hitting himself in the head with the slip-ons, and it doubled their sales. Just that one movie alone. I mean, it's just it's crazy how much so many media, of those moments. Love yeah, it. How much media really mattered back then? Uh, now you know it would probably just oh, go on back TikTok. Then, for, still, look what the damn Daniels, the damn Daniels thing. were the same thing. They yeah, sold just. so <laughs> many fucking pairs. They he he gets them for life. Back at fucking it crazy. Again. Back at it again. Uh, but it didn't help. Uh, as much as, it, as yeah. it should have, because in 1984, Vans just, actually just, had to go through a Chapter 11 bankruptcy. Uh, and that was all due to James Van Dorn kind of trying out all, all different kinds of sports that we could get and uh, thought they could get into football, basketball, breakdancing, skydiving. I mean, they were really getting themselves thin. Uh, and when the bank comes knocking, if you don't have their money, they... They can actually like tell you they who and who like does not them. work for your company anymore. Yikes. So James got James got the boot. Uh, Paul came back to actually do his magic again, and and within three years had paid down twelve million dollars worth of debt, which is 
Paul's unreal. Crazy. We stand yeah. Paul, Why? dude. Paul yeah. is unreal. Total stand on Paul. Yeah, they uh they uh they talk about that briefly in the forward and like the meeting, that initial meeting to to try and get Paul to come back where they all just kind of walked into the room with their tails between their legs. Why did he bail? He got too old? Uh, you know, I didn't get there yet in the book, Ken. God, he just outed me. I don't know. Probably I Googleable. I, I think so it was just probably sure. running so well itself that he just take some time off. Maybe you time wanted some other to shit to boating. do too. Go, yeah, go boating. <laughs> put put your own shoes on and go boating. Uh, but we're also talking about a 1980s America, and things just weren't exactly the best back then either. So you know, banks are they want their money. So yeah. if they if they have a big loan out and they come at, after vans, and they say, "Hey, can you pay back that loan now?" and you don't have it, there's some stuff you got to rework your company mm-hmm. when they do that. <laughs> you're you're quicker on that one. I know good. where it is. Oh, yeah, <laughs> uh, but also at the same time, we've got Steve Caballero. Mm. We, we like him still. Well, I do. We do like we him. We do like him still. Didn't, didn't hit us back for the interview. Didn't but hit that's us okay, back on Steve. Instagram. That's okay. that's. All right, Steve, I guess. Thanks, Steve. He probably wouldn't have enjoyed talking to us very much anyway, oh. so it's okay. I don't He's enjoy good. talking to myself. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we don't need uh, Paul Van Doren. What happens so yeah. in 88? Oh, my God. They sold the Vans company to the banking firm McCown D. Liu. D. Liu. I missed that part. I company. missed that part. Oh, yeah, yeah. So they, they sold out million. in 88 once they got out of their debt to a venture firm and said, shoop. Wow, 74 millies in 88. Nice. How much is that in today's time? We don't fucking <laughs> care. Uh, <laughs> That's still a lot of money. Uh, okay, in the I 90s. Four times, but here's, four a, here's times a good thing, too. Once you start getting companies into the hands of those types of people, you never know what happens to it. I mean, they're going to come in and just change oh. everything. Oh. And shockingly, they did not do that. Ooh, really? I mean, you got to be ready for that and, and yeah. just kind of accept that. If you're selling out for $74 million, it's yeah. like, well, wipe my hands clean, I guess. Time what to go. happens, Time happens. To go. Uh, but that's neat. Yeah, I guess. So the 90s, it, it held strong. And we like to, we're, we're referring to the 90s era in Vans as marketing mania. 91, they go public. Take us through that, Ken. Well, you have to get a, a bank to underwrite you your finances and do due diligence and then you sell shares to the company to nice. the public and it's a big capital raise and That's neat. the ownership of the original owners gets diluted yeah. but that ownership in turn raises in value because of the capital raise the more you know that sucked okay <laughs> <laughs> uh 91 they go public they're on the nasdaq stock exchange 93 they introduce van snowboard boots they're actually kind of going out of style too in the early 90s or you know the the skateboarding just wasn't there like it was they weren't selling a whole lot as i understand it everything goes in and out of style in and out of style especially from this this long of a time yeah sure yeah yeah. um so when they do come into 93 uh they get snowboard boots because that snowboarding was the next big thing thing i feel like a lot of places in 93 were still banning snowboarders on the hills it's like skateboarding on the hill it, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, um, but, so, but again they saw they saw a market that was coming up just as skateboarding was coming up right. i mean quite literally the same sports just different materials and this is a this is a time where you know we see them really kind of return when when you fall out of the graces of the public eye, the mm-hmm. the like the popular thing to wear. So if cheerleaders aren't wearing your shit anymore, what do you do? We see them return to really double down on their their core customer, that that action sports customer, the kind of the the skateboarders, the surfers, the snowboarders. So that's really what they're hitting hard in the nineties. They're ninety five. They sponsor the Warp Tour for the first time. Ninety six. Vans and Supreme launched um, their first uh, their first collab. It's uh, a pair of old schools. Um, they they sponsor the Triple Crown of skateboarding in '96 as well, uh, and then they open up a giant forty six thousand indoor outdoor uh, a forty six thousand square foot indoor outdoor skate park in uh, in Orange in California in the mall. And so they're really now like, okay, this is who we are. You know, it's like doubling down. If we if we aren't 
the popular shoe right now. We're, we're, we'll still be with our core customers. Skaters still need to skate. They still need a shoe to do it in. Uh, and so that that's going to be us. We'll, we'll sell to them for the moment. And again, this is a time when skateboarding was just taking over everything. The traditional sports, football, baseball, soccer, things like that, kids were still into. But when they saw skateboarding on TV, uh, MTV most especially, it did just absolutely caught fire and for vans to sit there at the beginning of it especially with the vans warp tour that's the one of the most iconic festivals in history yeah before festivals were even a thing and, and here's you know just a bunch of punk rockers going around and it wasn't even about the music initially um i remember warp tour three <laughs> yeah brian what's your what's your um gross revenue on balloons sold at warp tour <laughs> Well, I was 14 at the time. You were selling <laughs> balloons. Not helium yeah, balloons. Not the helium types. No, it was actually up in Boulder. Uh, it wasn't even at Folsom Field. What's the field right next to it? A par- it's just a park right next to the stadium like up Aaron in Boulder. Field? Farron Field, something like that. Farron's like just like the- On college. campus or off campus? It was on campus. Farron. Farron. It's got to be. Farron, yeah, 97. But they wow. had it in Boulder for a few years first. Uh, and they had just a massive half, half pipe in the middle of it, and you went there to see the skaters. Music was kind of secondary. Yeah. And to, if to this day, I hate Sugar Ray. To this day. <laughs> because this motherfucker took the microphone, shoved it down his pants, and just sat there farting on it and thought he was the funniest <laughs> dude. That is very funny. I hated him. <laughs> Mark McGrath. Oh you my will feel god! My wrath. One of these days. What a tool. Let's get him but, on the podcast. Uh, yeah, Sounds like I he'd be a good it. guest. I would love it. But it was you know mighty mighty Boston's Buck O Nine. I mean just the the punk and ska and and that kind of came up and and of course Vans just went astronomically big and and Vans actually owned the majority stake of it eventually. Actually, probably all of it. They towards the they end acquired it. it. Um, I saw it on their website somewhere, but I think it's in the two thousands. They acquire the entire okay, yeah. festival, and they're no longer just a sponsor. Two thousand one buys controlling, and they they did their tour. last oh yeet tour. They did their last tour. I think probably <laughs> the the best time because it was right before the pandemic, and yeah, they were done. They didn't have to pay people just to sit around. Panty pan the pan the panty pan. All right, two thousands. This is at by by the time we get into the two thousands, Vans is a household name. Mm. It is a large, large company. They're crushing it. This is the big leagues. Um, they're they're really starting to you know just take over, especially in their own space. Uh, two thousand one, they assist in the production of Dogtown and Z Boys. Uh, two thousand one, they also enter into the television broadcast deals for Triple Crown skateboarding with NBC Sports and Fox Sports Net. They, like we just said, by controlling interest in Warp Tour, they're making moves. Uh, two thousand three, uh, the the, tri- the Vans Triple Crown has over two hundred eighty five thousand attendees and fifty million watching on TV. That's insane, dude! Skateboarding. That's insane. I mean, this is when you could still get that many people to watch the same thing. Couldn't believe that. Now you have a million different things to watch. You're lucky if you get 100,000 well, people it's, to watch. It, it's like the Super Bowl yeah. and like Floyd Mayweather and Jake Paul fights <laughs> the only thing pulling that many fucking people watching. That's insane. That's 50 million watching uh, a skateboarding event. I mean, this is that's four years after Tony Hawk lands the 900. So this is peak skateboarding. Peak. Yeah. Peak skateboarding. Now, ever the innovators, Vans launch uh, customs. They launched the custom Vans at Vans.com. So this is that's cool. That's in 2004, and that's kind of a callback to those early days um, in the factory where people could just bring in their own fabric and bring in their own swatches, and people would would sew them onto the uppers for them. Uh, that that's a uh, that's something that, that that Vans now starts offering in the middle of the 2000s. You can make your own kind of like a Nike ID thing, which is also gigantic. And even in 2004. Yeah, 99 is when Nike ID came. Even in 2004, the internet isn't what it is today. You know, you could take it or leave it in 2004. You had to to watch it load for quite some time. I remember doing those customs. But you chose between five different uppers, a couple different lowers. It wasn't as custom as bringing in your dress. Right, right. No, that's that's, that's kind of ridiculous. Um, God, what would that cost now for a company to build you a pair oh, of shoes? Dude. So Thousands. absurd. So absurd. 
Uh, and also in 2004, kind of to cap all of this off, VF Corp. Um, you know, you guys probably know VF Corp, North Face. They own a bunch of shit, Supreme. They purchased Vans in 2004 for $396 million. God damn. So, I mean, we see back in 88, McCown and Duluth Comp and Co. bought it for $74 million. Proved to be an okay investment. Yeah, they got yeah. out. They got out in. for 396 So that's not too shabby at all. But then VF Corp turns it into $4 billion a year. Oh, I mean, so VF Corp um, can... They have, they have the juice. Yeah, they have the juice. That's crazy. Uh, man, what do we think? I, that, that Vans, dude. Yeah, we're in the mid-2000s, and everybody knows about Vans, and now we're in 2020, and... 2022 so now what's it about it's about i mean it, vans is what one thing that i think we can that's notable uh they've absolutely stayed true they the, the styles that we all that we see made were made in the 60s the authentics the styles that came about in the 70s the the old schools the skate highs the slip-ons the same six styles they sell today right mm -hmm. they yeah. they they have not they've not tried to reinvent the wheel they're not creating a bunch of different silhouettes. They're not doing the Nike and Adidas thing. They have kept it simple. They are on that in and out path, right? They have five silhouettes. Authentic, era, old school. Skate, skate highs and slip-ons. Slip that's what they got. And that's what they've been offering since the 70s. That's what you can get. You can get them a bunch of different colors and much different ways now. But these are our silhouettes. We don't need to make new ones. We don't need to make better ones because these are the best. What they're still doing and what they'll do what slides is, every so often or try and I mean they trade like some right yeah with the right but these they try but, but no point what they're right? still doing that i think is really their niche right now is like they'll put goddamn anything on a shoe bro like yeah. they yeah. will make any type of shoe and make a small number of them and and sell them they got glittery ones they got suede suede ones they got the weirdest prints on these shoes and they're just they're just sticking to it like that's what our shoes look like and we're just going to put anything on those panels like other you know like everything else in streetwear and shit like that uh collabs are obviously big for for for, for vans now as well saw the first supreme collab in 96 they've done a bunch since this is a pair of supreme vans they collaborated with with disney so i mean they've they this is a simpsons shirt Oh, I was gonna say, like, oh, literally, Bart pick, too. pick, yeah. pick a fucking licensed brand, even a streetwear brand right now. I, you have the Mad Happy Vans, like they have, Iron they Maiden, have done Metallica, Led Zeppelin. Yeah, you know, they still yeah. stick to their. Rock They've done it. And, yeah. Um. So you know that that's huge for them now too. Is the collabs, the licensed stuff that's very big, um, as well. But it's it's cool to see that just the 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 classics, the all white slip ons, the black. Black authentics, the skate highs and the, the the eras like still selling the half cabs. They're still mad yeah. cheap too, bro. You can buy a pair of eras for fifty dollars. Exactly right. Exactly right. Fifty five bucks. Fifty dollars in today's standards. <laughs> yeah. It's fifty five dollars in two thousand twenty two. <laughs> well, well, next year we, <laughs> next year it'll be different. Next year it'll be different. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, again, takeaways. Listen to your customer, pay attention to what they want, and don't be afraid to, to go out and, and deliver on what they want, uh, to take, take some chances on that. Um, it's all about work ethic, too. That man, Paul, he worked, and even from the time he was, just the, the moment he came in, you know, the first night, he switched around the whole floor factory, but he never stopped rolling up his sleeves. He, once he was a VP at Randy's, once he was head honcho at Vans, he was still building out every store himself. He was on the floor factory or on the factory floor overseeing things. Uh, he was very hands on and he believed that, you know, if the if your staff, if the people around you don't see you putting in the work, then how can you expect them to put in the work? Uh, and I, there's a lot to say about that.
Brian, do you have any takeaways? What's your moral of the story, Brian? Uh, you oh, know, it's wisdom. always it's always fun for me to kind of when I wear my skate highs. There's a reason why there's padding up on the top. There's a reason why the stripes there. There's a reason why they were made the way they are, and it connects you to a past in America that's just super cool to always think about. Maybe you don't have to think about your shoes every time you put them on. There's other things to think about right now, but there's you know there's there's reasons why things stay the way they do and think the way the way they succeed. So it's, it's always nice to kind of put names and faces and dates and, and events to these things and just kind of understand where it comes from. And maybe you can, maybe you too can start your own shoe company and know where it's going to go. You know what? We did this whole Vans podcast without shouting out Lil B in the pack. Wow. Got my Vans. Throw on. it out. Throw it out. Got to redo it. Wow. Delete. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Base God. Wow. Oh, base God. oh my God. All right. That's crazy. At least you got it in. At least you caught you, you remembered. We All didn't right. post it without it. So you at least remembered to mention it. So also baseball. Ted Williams, one of the, the greatest baseball players of all time. Just throwing that in there. Paul Van Doren loved Ted Williams. And I wanted to get that out there. So these ones are wild looking. These ones are wild looking. I just want to look like Sean Penn when I'm older. I think you have a crush on something. <laughs> I, 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 might, I think I do, too. I think I do, too. It happened. Uh, it's okay. That's all right. That's okay, Brian. That's all right. It's okay, Brian. I'm comfortable with it. Fuck. All right, we're done. We're done. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. See ya.